really excited about the pavilion for a number of reasons. First of all, because it's the first encapsulation of the project in a more complete, cohesive form. And that's what people will first realize if they've seen my work before, that this, the pavilion actually really, everything from the build, from the paper maze that you walk through, which is, gives you the sense of being enfolded in a book or enveloped in a book. And the way each facet or element of the artwork unfolds, but is not, everything is not readily visible, you would need to navigate through it, sort of akin to the act of reading or the act of listening. As you walk through the paper maze, I mean, you'll encounter a running coat, which will accompany you as you walk through. Um, so sort of, kind of, you walk along it, um, the way we read left to right. And th then the first thing you'll encounter actually is a stack of the book, um, a, a, a kind of monumental stack. And that's the latest volume of Pulp, which is it's called Pulp 3, an intimate inventory of the banished book. It's intimate because it again comes from a place of, of deep personal reflection and also per relationships built up with people over time. It's a looking back also at the stories that I've held with me over five years of this project. And, um, and, and I hope that people can find their own intimate resonances within the book. And while you're browsing through the book, um, behind you is actually on the paper is actually a kind of guide map to the whole project. So it's an artwork, um, one of my trees. Um, I make a lot of phylogenetic trees, which look like they're giving you ordered hierarchical information, but are actually doing the opposite. They can be, they pretend to be guide maps, but they aren't really, because a guide map should allow you to get lost as well. So there's space for you to wonder and not be sure about what it is you're encountering. So there's, there's not very much hand-holding through this whole bit. And the film is, uh, is a, it's a longish film um, because it looks at five years worth of work, but it, but it also looks at new work that I made specifically for the pavilion. It's actually quite a beautiful coincidence, but both Venice and Singapore have historically been centers or at least very important in the history of book production, print, and wherever you have a, a proliferation of print or you have a blossoming of print trade or book trade, book printing, publishing, writing and all of that, or everything that goes along with it. You also have a kind of, uh, you tend to have multiplicities, you tend to have plurality because people who can't publish anywhere will gravitate to these centers. And that's what happened with Venice, for instance. The Venetian Republic um, didn't censor as much as other parts of Europe. So people who couldn't publish anywhere else were coming to Venice to publish and to print, to get their works printed. And what happened then was that this became a place for multiple narratives. You didn't only have one dominant kind of um, a narrative that only benefited the aristocracy, for instance. Venice is also the birthplace of the paperback format, which is the true democratization of, of the book, right? Um, because before this, um, in Europe at least, the book was always um, this huge, heavy, t uh, you know, volume that, that was meant really for people who were very rich and could afford it. But um, Aldous Man, 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 uh, was the one who actually invented the paperback format and now you could actually carry it with you. And this led to a huge kind of change, sea change really in the way people read. There are two very interesting ideas here. Not only are these historic places of print, but they are also places, both places that have languages that are on the verge of extinction. Vanishing languages are of particular interest uh, for me personally, but also in this project. Um, because every 14 days we lose a language globally and um, the extinction of a language is a form of it's a, it's a, it's a form of cultural uh, I mean when you lose a language you lose an entire culture you lose a storehouse of knowledge that's embedded in that language you lose everything from the names of things the names of plants the names of I mean you lose everything you lose your link to land you lose your link to to um, history to um, Genealogy, everything is, 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 is uh, vanishes. I knew I always wanted to be an artist because so much of the best part of an artwork's navigation is invisible to the artist. In other words, once you exhibit something, it's you've released it into the wild. You have no control over it now. I really love that, that you hand off this kind of huge thing that you've been involved in, that you're so immersed in, it's now lo no longer yours. So yes, people will anyway be taking away parts of it when they walk through the space and encounter it and if they choose to remember it. But then also the book can travel that way. One of the reasons that we're printing 5,000 copies of the book is that we hope that people will want to take it away with them as well. Um, and we are considering different ways in which access can be extended beyond just physical 
the physical codex, the physical book.